Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Uh, my name is Jenna, and welcome to our online academy. Of course, you're joining us here uh, at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and we are located in Long Beach, California. So um, hello to everyone. Once again, my name is Jen. Joining me in the studio or around the studio today is uh, James, who's going to be helping me out with a lot of the visuals. And we also have Dana answering your questions or uh, kind of at the computer directing questions to, to me and answering them as well. So. Today, our focus is going to be learning about habitats and more specifically, uh, the sandy bottom habitat. So as we go along, if you do have any questions, you're always more than welcome to go on ahead and text them into our phone number right here uh, at 562-826-1838. And if you do happen to be watching this when we are no longer live, you are more than welcome to email us your questions as well uh, at this uh, email address down below live at lbaop.org. So let's go on ahead and start talking a little bit about sandy bottom habitats. And if we think about a habitat, right, that's a, it's a home for an animal. Uh, there are so many different habitats in our ocean, but say we're going to be focusing on sand. Now here at the aquarium, we do have a wide variety of sandy bottom habitats and James has pulled one up here. So as you can see here, what do you notice about a sandy bottom habitat? Hmm. Go on ahead, tell that to your neighbor, maybe your invisible friend, <laughs> right? So what do you notice about the sandy bottom habitat? Something that I see that really stands out is that there's lots and lots of sand, right? There is sand everywhere. It's coating the entire bottom. So we know that it's kind of at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, a lot of scientists like to call this the benthic area, right? The benthic, the bottom part of our ocean. So we're looking at mainly our seafloor here where it's covered with sand. We can see that there are some rocks above as well, right? And then of course there are some animals that we have here too see if we can maybe recognize some of these animals. I see here we have some sea anemones. We have a crab that's up here as well. And then we also have some fish. Now, it's really interesting if we think about this sandy bottom habitat, what do you think might be some challenges that these animals face as they live at kind of that sea floor level, right? Amongst the sand right there. It's not like our other habitats where there's lots of kelp, or there's tons of rocks around or bright corals where they can hide in a lot of nooks and crannies. Nope, the seafloor is very flat as we can kind of see, right? And there's a few rocks, which maybe they could hide in these little nooks and crevices, but maybe they can also take advantage of the sand too, right? So maybe they can hide underneath the sand, make it like a nice sandy blanket that they are covering themselves in. So. With that, right, we need to think about different adaptations, different ways in which these animals are able to survive in the sandy bottom habitat, right? Um, so one example of that is our flatfish that we have right here. Can you try to maybe make an outline around our flatfish? See if you can try to figure out where its entire body is. Let's see if I can make an outline. Uh, There-ish. I guess my outline's very squiggly. But here we have our entire flatfish. And what do you think might be the parts that are sticking up? Well, I definitely see a grumpy mouth right here. It's just kind of upturned. Then we also have two eyeballs that are straight up. So it's really interesting, right? Looking at these animals that we have right here uh, in our sandy bottom habitat, one of the challenges that they face is that there really aren't that many places to hide. So they have to kind of change their body and some of their features to be able to survive. Now, I just mentioned eyes, right, which are kind of on the top of their, their head right there, or body, I guess, right? And we know that they have a mouth, and even though it may look grumpy, right, it's upturned, it looks a lot like this, what do you think might be a benefit to having a mouth that's upturned? Any thoughts? Right, you can catch food that is directly kind of up above you. So it helps to know that not only is this animal camouflaged, right, being that flat, very similar color to that sand right there, 
but they have those eyes that are peeking up and around. So maybe they can see predators that may be around them. And they also have that mouth that they could just eat something that might be directly above them. Now, these flatfish, of course, are flatfish. So that's another adaptation, right? They are actually flat. Now, flatfish are one of my favorite fish altogether. You may know flatfish as turbot, sole, uh, halibut, flounder. Those are different kinds of groups of flatfish. But what's great and what's common about all these flatfish is, of course, they are flat. So let me bring up my little flatfish friend that I have here, along with my picture. So what's very interesting about our flatfish is that, of course, it actually is built like a normal fish. So these flatfish, when they're born, actually start out looking like regular fish on both sides, the same color on both sides. And their eyes, one on each side, actually. So it looks just like a normal fish, but really cute and really tiny. And it swims around, and then about, depends on the variety, but about several weeks old or so, eventually they start to settle down on one side, and then that eyeball goes from one side and migrates on over, oops, migrates on over to the other side. Isn't that interesting? So they end up having two eyes on one side of their head. Now, I think we have a juvenile flatfish picture that we're going to be bringing up in a little bit. Um, so you might be able to see it. Oh my gosh, it is absolutely adorable. Oh, how could you not love this fish right here? So you can see it's clear, right? So that's another great adaptation for these animals that live where there really aren't a whole lot of places to hide. So these animals, um, these baby flatfish right here are clear so they can blend in with the water. And you can see that eye slowly coming on over to the other side. So this is a great picture. And just think how small this is. I mean, it's like the size of whoever this thumb is, right? So it's super duper small, maybe only about like this big in size. Incredible. Ah, so adorable. So these flatfish, right, they're incredible. They not only are like normal fish, but that one eye will migrate over. Now, the another fun fact about flatfish eyes is that uh, there are, they are usually, uh, they usually pick a side in which they are moving the eye on over. On average, it's actually a similar percentage of right-handed humans to left-handed humans. So the majority of them, the eye will actually migrate to the right-hand side. We get a few left-handed, left-sided flatfish too, but most of them are actually right-sided, which is pretty interesting there. All right, so flatfish. Not only do they go on ahead and are able to be flat, they have those eyes that stick up on the top and they have that upturned mouth, right? That they use to go on ahead and ambush their food. But they also, not only do they bury themselves underneath the sand, they can match their habitat around them. Now, they aren't great as octopus are in that regards, but they can match the color of that sandy bottom habitat. There have been tons of experiments done where these flatfish have been given lots of different types of things to settle on. Like maybe there was a checkerboard and they kind of match that checkerboard pattern. Other times they match different colors of the sand. Uh, and so it's really incredible the way that these flatfish can really kind of blend in with whatever they happen to lie or lay directly on. So here we have our lovely sandy bottom habitat and who knows? Maybe there's a flatfish that's underneath here that we can't see, right? But that's the incredible part of the sandy bottom is that there's so much life, you just really have to look for it, right? It's making you earn looking at those animals. And so it's one of the challenges. Like how does an animal survive in, in a special environment like this? And also, how is this environment special? Let's well, say we're gonna be looking at some more animals um, and how they are able to adapt and survive in this really unique habitat. But it looks like we have a question that just came in and Elena is asking, is hiding or camouflage instinctive or is it learned? That's a great question. So thank you so very much for asking that. Well, if we go on ahead and uh, we look at camouflage, um, a lot of it has to be blending in with their environment. And though they may be like thinking about it, like, okay, I need to blend in, 
a lot of it is actually um, instinctive. So they have color changing cells on their body called chromatophores. Now these chromatophores, that's just a general term of saying color changing cells. There's lots of different varieties. Um, lots of varieties meaning that a lot of cells that can change to different colors. So there are some chromatophores that focus more on earthy tones. There are other chromatophores that focus in on brighter tones and they're able to use it kind of like a mix and match to then be able to blend in on their surroundings. So here's an example, right? The flatfish that we saw earlier was kind of a whitish color, but this shows some polka dots on it, right? So this is another way in which an animal can go on ahead and try to camouflage uh, with the local surrounding environment. It kind of has some little circles right up here that it's trying to camouflage against. And it really also breaks up this fish, right? Like which way is, which way is front, which way is back? Hmm. It's really tricky to see, right? You can't even, if I move to the side, it's really hard to even see the eyes on this fish, right? Where, where are those eyes? So camouflaging is definitely more of an, of an instinctive thing that they try to do in order to survive in that kind of almost looks barren-y sort of Western, almost like kind of habitat, right? You can imagine horses or seahorses just kind of going along uh, down in that, that habitat right there. Though, unfortunately, I don't think there are too many seahorses in a real sandy bottom habitat. Maybe if they did a sandy bottom Western, then there might be. All right. So great question. Thank you, Elena, for, for asking that. But yeah, these flatfish are absolutely incredible animals. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about, you know, we've talked about how they hide, but what about what they eat? Any thoughts to what these animals eat? Huh? Well, they live in the sand. They kind of hide. And they have the upturned mouth. So we know that they're kind of like ambush predators, right? So they'll go on ahead and sit and wait till something delicious comes by and then they'll go on ahead and eat it. Now that might be a wide variety of things, right? It could be maybe um, some, some other fish that are slowly coming by and trying to sneak across that sandy bottom habitat. Maybe it's other animals that live in the sand too, but maybe make their home in the sand. A little bit different than just living on top of the sand. The animals that live inside the sand, like in between the sand grains and the nicks and crannies, those are called interstitial creatures. So these interstitial creatures live in between the grains of sand. So that might be worms, for instance. Maybe there are some crabs that bury themselves deep down into the sand. It really kind of depends. And all these flatfish that I've been talking about earlier, and flatfish, once again, is just a general group. So your flounders, soles, turbots, um, all sand dabs, all of those friends, they all have a little bit of a different strategy in what they eat and where they're located. Like the halibut are voracious predators are really huge versus uh, maybe sand dabs, which are, um, or tongue fish that are really only about this big. Um, ah, are the, about this big, um, you know, they might eat different kinds of food. So they might eat maybe more like small shrimp or krill versus a halibut that might actually actively hunt some of some fish that are around or maybe eat some crabs. And so uh, it really kind of depends on that flatfish. And I know Angela, you and I had, so we're, de we're definitely thinking similar things. So hopefully that answered your question in regards to what flatfish eats, right? So they are an incredibly diverse group, but they definitely share some of these fun characteristics of being able to, to change and camouflage, have that flat body, start out life as a normal fish um, and have that eye migrate from one side to the other and be more like ambush or active predators. So now we've had a chance to talk a little bit about an animal that lives on top of the sand and in the sand. Now living with the sand kind of being the main, the main um, kind of component here to a sandy bottom, let's go on ahead and let's think about sand in general. Now you might think sand is kind of is kind of you know bottom. It's on the bottom. It's there. What's so exciting, right? But sand is actually really exciting. It can tell us a lot of information. Even if you're at the beach, that sand can tell you a lot of information as well. If looking at the type of sands, if you ever get a chance to look very closely up at some sand, um, you might notice that there are lots of different colors and actually a lot of different shapes on the sand itself. 
Now those shapes and those colors can tell us a, an entire story of where the sand came from and how it got to where it is now. So if you happen to see sand that's maybe made up of quartz, um, that's a particular type of rock variety, and you happen to see that's very round, right? All of these little sand pieces are very round. That means it's had a way to maybe tumble through a lot of the waves. Um, and a lot of these, the quartz actually comes from land. So as it travels, it breaks off other types of cliff sides or off of other rocks through weathering and erosion. All of that breaks down into bigger chunks, which then tumble through maybe uh, you know streams or, or rivers, and it slowly gets break down to smaller chunks and smaller chunks, and eventually it turns up being really small and really round due to all of that tumbling that's had. Right? So that's one type of sand that you can get, and that sand is found off of land, so quartz. Another sand variety that you could also get might be carbonate sand. Now, all of those sand pieces are going to be usually whitish in color and really kind of jagged edges. So they're going to have little sharp edges here or there. They might be irregular shapes, so it might not be, you know, a smooth round circle. And a lot of this carbonate sand comes from either dead animal bones that are slowly have been broken down or shells of other animals too as they break and they kind of tumble along too. They don't get as much tumbling as a lot of those, you know, um, land rocks as might where they get a lot of weathering and erosion as they tumble down. But these other carbonate sand pieces eventually come on down and they, they make up sand that we have here too. Now, depending upon where you are in the ocean, your sand could be made up of a wide variety of other things. Tons of other minerals can be also part of your sand. Maybe if you happen to live near a volcano, right, you may get different kinds of sand there too. Um, and so it really kind of depends on where you live. And I think that's one of the cool things is that sand around the world is so incredibly different. And so here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we are currently showcasing just one kind of sand, but a lot of these animals can live um, still in the sandy bottom habitat, even though their sand may be made up of different things. I'm a big fan of sand, can you tell? <laughs> All right, we do have a few questions, so thank you. Feel free to keep on bringing them in. Uh, we got a question of what animals eat flatfish? Mm, I can think of one right here. <laughs> I love a good flatfish. They are absolutely delicious as a sandwich, uh, as fish and chips, you name it, I'll eat it. Uh, but it really it depends on the variety. Uh, you know, there's some, like I mentioned before, halibut, really big, very delicious, can make plenty of meals there. Um, tongue fish, really small super duper thin. Uh, it gets its name because it looks like a tongue, basically. You know, you may get maybe an order out of that. Not very much at all. And so it really kind of depends. But aside from humans who go on ahead and eat flatfish, uh, there are lots of other animals too. And so let's go on ahead and let's actually look at one. Uh, some rays also eat flatfish and they are also very flat animals. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about rays once we get that up. But yeah. Ah, so Dana just shouted on in. Uh, Allison, I know that you're curious to know where do you find flatfish? And yeah, they're really tricky to see, right? They're all hidden underneath that sand. But basically with these flatfish, you can find them in sandy bottom habitats. Now you're like, well, Jen, where, where are these sandy bottom habitats? I gotta go, I gotta know. And so with that, it really kind of it really kind of depends um, on where you live and where you can find these sandy bottom habitats. You can find a lot of them in tropical waters uh, near coral reefs when those break down. You'll get a lot of sand and so that's an, one great area. Um, I know off of the California coast there are also several areas where you can find sandy bottoms. Um, out in the deep sea or out in the deep sea you actually will find a ton of sandy bottoms. One of my favorite things about the deep sea sandy bottom habitat is you'll see traffic animal traffic. Like you will see clams that you don't actually see the clam, but you can see where that clam went. So you'll see that clam line and you can be like, oh, okay. So that clam moved from here to there to there. And you can watch all these animals of where they used to move. So it's really interesting out and in, out where you can find it. Now out in the open ocean too, 
right? There might be some, some lovely sandy bottom habitats too. So that's one, another really cool thing is that these sandy bottom habitats are found practically everywhere, right? So no matter where you are, warm water, cool water, deep water, open ocean water, you can find a sandy bottom habitat, each with its own set of unique animals and with its own set of unique challenges and features. So let's go on ahead and uh, let's see if we can talk a little bit about rays. Now, these are another set of animals that are related to sharks, right? And so with, this, uh, with these rays that we have right here, you might see that they too are kind of flat in shape. Now, rays, as I mentioned, are related to sharks. They are also a type of cartilaginous fish. Now, if you're first time hearing that word cartilaginous, what do you think that might mean? Or for those of you that have heard it, refresh my memory. What do you think that, that refers to? If you're thinking maybe stuff that's on your nose and your ears, you got it. So cartilage is just a different kind of material than the current bone material that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. And this cartilage is very much uh, a lot more flexible and a lot lighter, right? And so this cartilage skeleton is used by a lot of sharks and also their relative, the rays that we have right here. And so these rays, as you can see, kind of have these flexible bodies. They're very flat and squished, much like our flatfish are. They have modified fins. So they have these modified uh, pectoral fins right here that kind of come out and help them to be able to kind of glide and move. Now, depending upon the ray, maybe they might use them to actually glide. Maybe they undulate and they move them up and down like that, kind of like how you can see here, right? Except I think that one's moving more up and down. And so there's all sorts of different kinds of movements that these rays can do to be able to move through the water while having that really kind of flat shape. Now, if we think about our flatfish, right? And I'm going to bring on my little friend right up here. With our flatfish, we noticed when they were in the sand, that they had their two eyes that were pronounced, that they were up, right? And then we had the mouth that was also kind of turned up too. Now, if we look at our rays, well, their eyes are definitely more on the very tops of their heads, but what about their mouths? Hmm, can you find the mouth on our ray picture that we have here? Hmm, let's see. I think I can see it right here. How interesting, their mouths are on the bottom. So what kind of foods do you think they might eat? Well, to give us more clues, let's go on ahead on over to our document camera to get a better view of the actual teeth of some rays. Here we go. All right, so here we have the document camera. Hello, that is my hand. And I'm going to bring over our ray jaw. Now, you may be like, wait, what? I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. And if we go on ahead and look, these are actually the top and bottom teeth of our rays. And you're like, what, Jen? How, how is that teeth? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, if we zoom in, it's kind of tricky to see, but does anybody see any, like, really jagged edges? Hmm. Seems pretty smooth to me. And it almost reminds me of, oh, what is it? The, the snake skin, right? Kind of has a similar pattern. But believe it or not, these are actually teeth of stingrays. Yeah. So these rays have two sets of teeth. They have teeth that are on top and teeth that are on bottom that you can see here and they actually crunch. So they crunch and they grind and that's how they're actually able to eat their food. So any thoughts on what their food might be? If their mouths are located on the bottom and they have two almost like plate-like teeth that they use to crunch. Ah, if you're thinking crabs, you got it. Crabs are one of their favorite foods. They love to eat crabs. They like to eat even fish. Um, crabs right here, it's a great picture of one, right? So nice and crunchy foods they have no problem with. They can eat clams. They can eat, you know, um, I guess they don't normally eat mussels too much. Maybe they might eat some 
Um, other kind of animals that, that are a little bit crunchy, they can maybe even eat some worms. Um, a lot of animals that kind of survive out and live maybe inside of those grains of sand again, so those interstitial animals, right? And so they're able to use their mouth underneath and be able to scoop those animals up, crunch them up, and eat them. So that's one special adaptation that these rays have that really help them to survive um, and to be able to eat out in the wild. So it's pretty, pretty incredible for those different types of animals there, those different rays. Now, these rays, if we can go back to that ray picture real quick, you might have noticed that there were gill slits on the very bottom here. So we have them right there. Well, that's really interesting. If gills help an animal breathe, why would their gill slits be on the bottom? It's kind of weird, right? Like, if they go on the bottom, are they just going to suck up all that sand? Well, lucky for them, they have something that's right up behind their eye. And you can kind of see it here. It almost looks like there's a few bubbles that are kind of coming out of there. And so those are called spiracles. Oh, here's a great picture. And these little holes are the way that these rays are able to breathe without sucking up all that sand. So these spiracles are able to suck in that water and they're able to pass it through their gills and then out it goes. So it really is a cool and convenient way for these animals to be able to breathe without having to, to deal with any of that, of that pebbly sand that they are on. So here's a really good picture of their eyes, as we mentioned. A lot of these animals, once again, have those eyes that are sitting more up on top. And once again, our mouths of our flat ray right here are located underneath too. Now, alongside of these animals here, our rays also happen to have a singing barb that helps them to survive. Now, you might have thought that a singing barb is all the way at the very tip of our stingray's tail, right? I did too as well, until I got to see one of my very first stingrays and then I noticed, oh my goodness, it's actually right there. So it's a very cool way that they are able to protect themselves because unlike flatfish, these animals here can't really camouflage. They don't have those chromatophores, those color changing pigments that help them to blend in. But they do have a different type of camouflage because if you notice, these animals are black on top and white under bottom. Can you think of other animals that might be black or blue on top and then kind of white underneath? Now, there are a ton of animals that have that kind of coloration, right? Maybe sharks like we have right here, maybe penguins, maybe a lot of fish, right? And so what's really cool about this type of camouflage is it may not seem like camouflage at all, right? It's like, well, it's two very different colors. I can see the animal right there. That believe it or not, it is a type of camouflage called counter shading. So it's where it's a little bit more darker on top and lighter underneath. And so that's really great for those animals that feel bold enough to live right in the middle of the ocean water column, right? They're not at the super tippy top. They're not at the super deep. They are somewhere right in that middle. And what's great about counter shading is it allows them to blend in no matter where they are. Now, if there's an animal underneath that's looking up, right, it blends in with the sun, right? And it's really bright. So if you can imagine maybe if you're in a pool and you were down below and you were looking up, you might see that bright shininess on top of the water. Same thing for these animals here. So the whiteness blends in with that brightness up top. Now, if you're an animal, ah, oh, here's a great example. Now, if you're an animal also looking down, right, and you're like, ah, oh, I'm looking for something delicious and tasty underneath. Ah, oh, it's really hard to be able to see these animals because they then blend in with the darkness and the blue that may be below. And so it's a really cool way to be able to camouflage with nothing really right next to you. All right, looks like we have a few more questions. Uh, Riley was asking, how does a flatfish eye move to the other side? Oh man, right, that is a great question. It's something that just naturally happens over time. I don't think it's necessarily on like any kind of track or anything, but it just slowly eventually moves. And there's actually some really cool time lapse. We don't have any right now, but if you look on the internet with parents' permission, of course, to be able to look at some of these time lapse shots, you might see over time that one eye just slowly over many days 
moving on over to the other side where the two eyes are. It's really cool. So thank you for asking, Riley. And we also got another question. What is the difference between a stingray and a manta ray? Now, I use stingray as a general term, but there are so many rays out there, and manta ray is, is, a, is a type of ray. So the rays that we've been looking at in our other pictures have mainly been bat rays, which are one of my personal favorites. Um, and so there are so many different varieties out there, much like how there's different varieties of flatfish with the flounder sole, turbot, sand dab, you know, tongue fish, etc. There's also lots of varieties of rays right here, which is really cool. And so this is an example of a, com of a different kind of ray. It's called a rhino ray. And what's really cool about this one is that we don't know a whole lot about rhino rays yet. We're still exploring, we're still discovering, and we are still learning about this different kind of ray. Now these rhino rays are actually quite shy, if I'm not mistaken, and so we're still trying to figure out, like we're still trying to find them, We'll start trying, we're still trying to learn about them. And so what's really cool is that if these rays or if the sandy bottom habitat really excites you and you're like, this is a really cool habitat, there's still so much to explore. There's still a lot of shy animals, almost like the cats of the sea, right? The one of my cat is almost like a dog, but very shy. And so there's so much still to discover. And I'm really excited that we were able to share some of these ocean animals and habitats with you today. If you do have any further questions, unfortunately we are practically out of time, but you always are more than welcome to email us at live at L-B-A-O-P. Org. Here we go. We have it right here. Feel free to email us at any time and we'd be happy to be able to answer any of those sandy bottom habitat questions. So thanks again for joining us and we're looking forward to seeing you for our next program, which is going to be Draw With Me! And James is going to be doing that class today. And so stay tuned. It's going to be a fun-filled class. What a great Thursday. I'm having a good time and I hope you are all too. Thanks again and we'll see you soon. Bye.